and, and uh, Eric, uh -huh. you're all coughing now, so you can feel free to test your screen, Jerry. Okay, hang on just a second. There we go. It was great. Thank you. Originally, I was planning to arrange your previous uh, PhD, uh, your PhD uh, with uh, Wei Gu to be oh. a cohort to be a co-host for the seminar. Uh huh. But he he is shying away from doing this job, but I hope that's, he will. That's all right. He will attend. <laughs> anyway. I hope he can be a host to this time. But anyway, that's okay. So the seminar is about ninety minutes. Feel free to take, take your time, but there will be a, a one more seminar at four p.m. So I think we should uh, roughly conclude uh, like five minutes before, in case you need uh, like uh, nearly two hours. But just in case, as ninety minutes before is totally fine. Just that, that sounds good. Yeah. This the next seminar is at four o'clock. Okay. That's, yeah, four o'clock. Right? Yes, yes. Four okay, good, good. So that's um, <laughs> so I'm on the same page. No problem. <laughs> Also, there's a, another hidden conservation law about the attendee of the seminar. So in case you do, if uh, there are not as much people showing up on the seminar, seminar then actually there will be more people watching the YouTube live on the, on the recording. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, so just let you know in case. But no, it's, yeah. it's, it's fine. It's, I, 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 I don't, uh, it, it doesn't bother me either way. No yeah, if it's a small, there are even advantages to having a small crowd, at least um, modulo YouTube, people feel, I, I don't know about the effect of being recorded on YouTube, but at least ordinarily in a small seminar, people would be much more willing to ask questions and um, uh, discuss the material more. Um, um, I don't know how that works with YouTube in the mix, but, um, uh, but hey, it's, mm -hmm. it's all fine. No problem. In any case, I think that we can regularly start. So welcome, and we also feel the call. Okay, great. <coughs> welcome everyone to our CMSA quantum matter in math and physics seminar series. It's our great honor to have a professor Eric Schott from Virginia Tech. He'll be speaking about a series of his works on uh, this uh, application of decomposition of two anomaly resolution. And I would like to remind the audience, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. You can just directly uh, speak up. Or if you want to raise your hand, please feel free. So that's directly welcome, Eric. Please take over, thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. It's an honor to be asked to speak in this series. Um, let me begin by saying that I come from a slightly different um, uh, group. I come from particle physics, not condensed matter physics, whereas I gather most of the audience members here are in condensed matter. So I've tried to um, write the talk with that in mind, but I'm sure that I have not quite hit the target. So please, everyone, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions and slow me down to, uh, to help it make sense. That's, uh, that's why I'm here after all. So what I'm going to be talking about is really a follow-up to some work of some of the people in the audience today. Um, in general terms, my talk concerns the application of something called decomposition, what seems to be a, a somewhat newish notion in quantum field theory, to a procedure for resolving anomalies in finite, engaged finite groups as proposed relatively recently by Wang, Wen, and Witten. So what's decomposition? Well, briefly, decomposition is the observation that some quantum field theories are secretly equivalent to disjoint unions of other quantum field theories, which in this context we call universes. Now, when this happens, we say the quantum field theory decomposes and decomposition of the quantum field theory can be applied to give insight into its properties. So what does it mean for one quantum field theory to be a sum of other quantum field theories? How it's can just, we it's, it's go just, for it? Sorry, just make sure. Uh, the universe here is uh, like, a, how, how do you count? Just make sure you, you count the whole thing or each of them are a universe. Just make each, sure each of them separately. So in, um, in this, there would be, in that little schematic animation, there would be three different universes. So I'll, 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 I'll mm -hmm. explain in more detail later, no but, 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 but that said, please do uh, bring on the questions. It's, it's all good. Uh, hang on, let me. Right, so when does this happen? What does it mean for one field theory to be a sum of other field theories? Well, one uh, perhaps most basic aspect of this is that the, the amalgamated quantum field theory needs to contain some topological operators that act as projectors. So I need for the product of, well, I need for any one of these projectors to square to itself and for the product of two different projectors to be zero. That's um, uh, essentially that first statement there. Um, that's this statement. And then in addition, I want there to be a completeness relation. I want the projectors to project onto everything, which means the sum of the projectors need to add up to the identity. Now, in terms of correlation functions, this also has a, a simple um, meaning for correlation functions. If I take any correlation function in the original theory, then using this identity, I can just insert the identity and write it as a sum of correlation functions like so then because these are topological operators, because they are position independent, and because they squared themselves, I can take that single pi i and just spread it out to multiply each of the um, op operators in the correlation function. And then finally write the original correlation function as a sum over correlation functions, um, each one getting a contribution from a different um, target of the projection, from a different universe. So, uh, there's a mathematics analog that might help make a little more sense of this for some audience members, depending. depending. Um, if a space M has um, several connected components, then the dimension of its degree zero cohomology reflects the number of components. Um, something analogous is going on here. You might think of these projectors as being uh, linear combinations of degree zero cohomology, if you're coming at this from a mathematics direction. Now, this has some other implications. Another implication is that partition functions decompose. If I start with the partition function in the original quantum field theory, okay, that's some sum over states weighted by the Hamiltonian in the usual fashion. Uh, one of the implications of, uh, of decomposition is that it should be possible to write that partition function as a sum of other partition functions, the sum of, where the zi's are the partition functions of the constituent quantum field theories. Now, if something like this is happening, if there's this sort of you know, broad structure in a field theory, in general terms, one expects that the field theory should have a symmetry, and that is certainly the case here. Um, it turns out that in n plus one space-time dimensions, um, for a theory to decompose means it has a possibly non-invertible n-form symmetry. And I'll explain what those words mean in a few minutes. I just wanted to make the point that there really is a, a symmetry lurking in the background behind all of this. 
Now, decomposition is sometimes confused with spontaneous supersymmetry, uh, with spontaneous symmetry breaking and super selection sectors. So let me take a, a minute to wander through that. Um, and as uh, I'm sure everyone knows, but bear with me while I review, um, in spontaneous symmetry breaking, one has a notion of super selection sectors, which looks almost like disjoint quantum field theories at low energies, but with some important differences. So the um, primary example to my mind of a super selection sector involves um, uh, magnetization. If I you know, have a magnet, its spins are all aligned in a particular direction, which gives rise to its net magnetization. Um, however, I, uh, there's nothing in nature that really told me that the spins have to lie in that direction. They could point in other directions instead. And indeed, if I take that magnet and heat it up and let it cool down, then after it cools down, the spins may well end up aligned pointing in some different direction. I think of those um, low energy spin alignments as being analogs of super selection sectors. There is one physical theory, that bar magnet, um, the spins can point in different directions depending upon its you know, recent history of heating and cooling, um, but I can get between any one spin alignment to any other spin alignment if I heat the system up and let it cool down. So more formally, in terms of super selection sectors, we might say that super selection sectors have uh, these sorts of properties. They are separated by dynamical domain walls. If I have uh, two different regions uh, that correspond to two different super selection sectors, there's a domain wall between them, but it can have dynamics. These super selection sectors further will only become genuinely disjoint deep in the infrared or only uh, deep in a, uh, an infinite volume limit. Um, for any finite volume, or if you're not deep in the infrared, you can walk between super selection sectors if you're willing to pump enough energy into the system. So in particular, there's only one overall quantum field theory in spontaneous symmetry breaking. And here I've tried to sketch up a simple prototype for this, a potential with two different vacua. And schematically, I'm thinking of the different vacua as being some model of super selection sectors. The point being that I can still get from any one vacuum to another vacuum just by pumping enough energy into the system. Now, decomposition is different. Here, the idea uh, is that uh, the universe is as they are, which you might think was being somewhat analogous to super selection. However, the universes are separated by non-dynamical domain walls. There's no um, you know, games you can play with them. Furthermore, the universes are disjoint at all energy scales. I can't get from one universe to another universe just by pumping in more energy. They are really distinct from one another completely. Um, this reflects the fact that in a decomposition, we really have multiple different quantum field theories present. The idea here is that we have one amalgamate, what looks like one amalgamated field theory, but there's a way to separate out its degrees of freedom into mutually disjoint uh, sectors that absolutely never talk to one another at all. So just to try to um, drive this point home, here's another simple example. Um, of some parallels between decomposition and spontaneous symmetry breaking that will hopefully uh, help illustrate the differences. Let's consider um, a sigma model on a disjoint union of n spaces or a disjoint union of n quantum field theories. Each of those spaces, each of those separate quantum field theories, basically each of these blobs here corresponds to a universe, this sort of stricter analog of a super selection. Now, for basic reasons, this theory will have topological projectors that will project the states of the amalgamated theory onto states associated with each of these individual blobs. And furthermore, because they are projectors, they will obey the standard um, relations here. The pro uh, any projector will square to itself. The product of two different projectors will always be zero because they're trying to project different things. And furthermore, there's a completeness relation. The sum of all the projectors is the identity. Furthermore, there is an order parameter. I can take a linear combination of all these projectors weighted by powers of some root of unity. And then I can do things like compute the VEV of that order parameter in say the ith of the one of these universes. And I'll get a different value for that VEV depending upon which particular universe I'm in. Just a, a simple computation. So, you know, very formally, if we uh, go around classifying phases just in terms of existence of order parameters, we could take this theory that's a disjoint union and say, well, it has an order parameter, so it's 
an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. But that's clearly missing the most important part of the physics, which is the fact that the different sectors really are completely disjoint from one another. So you know, this is hopefully a, uh, will help explain the difference between uh, what I mean by decomposition and super selection sectors. Now, I mentioned higher form symmetries, and I put off explaining that. There's a, a lot of material to get through. So what's a, what's a one form? Excuse me. Uh -huh. so, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit confused. So here you write that the SIG model on the disjoint union of n spaces, but mm -hmm. in the picture, oh, I, I see, I see. So the, these spaces are really uh, di disjoint from each other. Yep, okay. yep, that's the idea. That's the idea. Yeah. They, they really also, are, huh? So, sorry. It's all good? Yeah, and also I, I wonder, can, can we formulate this decomposition more formally, uh, you know, in the axioms of topological quantum field theory? You know, uh, you, so usually me, we define topological quantum field theory as a mono, monoidal functor, but mm -hmm. if we take the right sum of monoidal functors, it's no longer a monoidal functor. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I, 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 I don't have a direct answer to that question, but I have a couple of indirect answers. So mm -hmm. one of the next things I'm going to do is uh, talk a bit about how to set this up in terms of symmetry properties, which isn't precisely free phrasing things in terms of properties of functors, granted. Um, later on, I'm going to make some general remarks about the special case of two-dimensional topological field theories, uh, which also isn't exactly rephrasing things in the language of you know, some general suitable observation about monoidal functors. But um, let, me, let, me, uh, let me ask you to uh, hang on to that question. Um, I'll talk about symmetries. I'll talk about uh, topological field theories later. And in between, I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of examples. And none of these examples will precisely reformulate everything in the language of uh, you know, some game with functors. But I suspect that after you see what I have to say about topological field theories, that might answer your question. So bear with me. And if by the end of the talk, I have not given you a, uh, uh, an answer you're happy with, ask me again, and I'll, I'll take another stab at it. How about that? OK, thank you. No problem. All right, so what's a one-form symmetry? So intuitively, this will be something like a group that exchanges the non-perturbative sectors in that quantum field theory. So my, uh, a simple example of this is a, a gauge theory, and maybe this is not the best example for a condensed matter audience, but uh, bear with me, we're gonna see plenty of other examples of this later on. So it's, um, uh, let's imagine uh, gauging, uh, we take a theory, we gauge the action of some ordinary group, but let's suppose that all the matter, all the fields are invariant under some subgroup of that group. Um, technically, if I wanna talk about a one form symmetry, I need to assume K is abelian, uh, decomposition exists more generally. Uh, let me just gloss over all subtleties for the purposes of trying to make this talk uh, reasonably comprehensible. Then at least in the special case that K is a central subgroup, that K lies in the center of G, the non-perturbative sectors are going to be invariant under this particular permutation of G bundles. I start with a G bundle or a G instanton, and I can generate another G bundle or a G instanton basically by tensoring in a K bundle or at the level of gauge fields. I take a gauge field for the original gauge theory and I add to that the gauge field for a, um, um, well, for a gauge field associated to a K bundle. Um, now, this gives a, a permutation of the non-perturbative sectors. It's certainly moving them around. And moreover, because the matter is all invariant under this subgroup, it's not just permuting them. This is actually a symmetry. The different non-perturbative sectors that are mapping into one another are uh, making the same contribution to the path integral. So this is generating a symmetry of the theory, albeit a somewhat more obscure one. This is not an action of an element of a group. It's an action of a group bundle, which is somewhat different from what we usually think about when we talk about symmetries, which is why this has a this sort of thing has a funny name, why I'm not talking about it as an ordinary symmetry. Now, in mathematics, these sorts of symmetry groups uh, have been around for quite a while. Uh, the standard notation for such a thing is to write uh, this is BK. Um, in some parts of the physics community lately, it's become fashionable to write this with a K superscript one. Um, I'm gonna try to use both notations to try to you know, satisfy audience members who may be uh, familiar with one or the other notation. 
There's another way of representing these one form symmetries as well in the algebra of lo topological local operators. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Now, what sort of quantum field theories admit a decomposition? I've, I've waved my hands that there exist such things, but I haven't yet given you any examples. So the field theories I'm interested in, which have a decomposition, are one plus one dimensional theories with what are called what global one form symmetries. And these have several different ways, uh, have several different descriptions. One way, which I basically just outlined, is as a gauge theory with a trivially acting subgroup. Uh, we just saw that such a theory admits a one form symmetry. And indeed we'll see later that these theories will naturally decompose. Another way to build something that decomposes is to take an ordinary quantum field theory and restrict the allowed instantons. Now, ordinarily, this would be a big no-no for reasons that Weinberg taught us back in the 70s. If I take a quantum field theory and start restricting the allowed instanton numbers, then this immediately violates cluster decomposition. Um, it, it doesn't ordinarily make sense. Now, there is a special case in which it makes sense, which is if the theory in question is really a disjoint union of other quantum field theories. If the theory decomposes, then there also cluster decomposition is broken, but in an extremely mild and um, uh, understandable fashion. So it's not, um, uh, it's something to be aware of, but it doesn't create any huge problems. Now, the, there's another way to think about this, which is mostly orthogonal to this talk, but I want to mention it because this is how I personally actually got into this stuff a long time ago. If one tries to build a sigma model on a certain generalized spaces called gerbs, one gets to these structures. So a gerb is basically a fiber, it's a kind of fiber bundle. Um, it's a fiber bundle in which the fibers are groups of these one form symmetries. So if I formulate a sigma model on any fiber bundle, then I expect that sigma model to have a group of symmetries corresponding to translations along the fibers. And this is no exception. If you correctly formulate a sigma model on a gerb, the resulting quantum field theory will have a symmetry corresponding to translations along the fibers. Here, since the fibers are groups of one form symmetries, the translation symmetry in question will be um, a one form symmetry rather than an ordinary symmetry. Um, in any event, this is, you know, all ties together. Now we'll see in this talk, amongst other things, we'll see in this talk how decomposition into the different constituent, uh, into the different universes relates to these pictures. So very briefly, I mentioned that uh, these theories often have a restriction on instantons that can appear as an interference effect between the different universes. I have several different field theories. They all have path integrals with sums over instantons. But if I have different theta angles, if I weight the instanton sums in slightly different ways, then I can arrange for some of the instanton uh, contributions to cancel one another out. Um, one form symmetries, I mentioned these correspond to translation symmetries along the fibers of the gerb. Again, I'm not gonna be talking about gerbs for the most part, but I, it's near and dear to my heart. So it, uh, I would feel amiss if I didn't mention it. Um, this business about trivial group actions. I said that gauge theories with trivially acting subgroups are examples. This arises basically because the model for a one form symmetry group is a gauge theory quotienting just a point. And later on, we'll see why this is actually, why this has any structure, why this is non-trivial. Now, yes, question. go for it. Just make sure. So the one point symmetry here is some uh, global symmetry whose uh, a charge, the object is one dimensional lines while their corresponding topological operator that major the symmetry as the symmetry generator is the zero dimensional objects. So let me just make sure what's the one dimensional lines that the charge object you are thinking about. And is that a zero dimensional symmetry generator some vertex or that's, vortex that's, operator? That, that's right. So the zero dimensional <laughs> objects are going to be so a couple of slides ago, I mentioned that there were some, um, uh, that what, another way to think, in fact, here, let me just go back to um, here. At the bottom of the slide, I mentioned that one form symmetries can also be seen in the algebra of topological local operators. Those are exactly the uh, dimension zero operators you just mentioned. And the dimension one operators in these theories are going to be things like Wilson lines, um, or depending upon what context you want to play with topological defect lines. Let me, uh, uh, Larry Ron, okay. but or Larry Ron for there, so, but the, so, the so, so, so objects are these right here. So just make sure because when you say sigma model, 
uh, hmm? maybe some people may not necessarily introduce gauge field. So here you already introduced hmm. gauge field in the Sigma model. Um, um, I, here I'm just talking about gauge theories. So oh, gauge, okay. and I'll, I'll come back to Sigma models in I a see. couple of minutes. Okay. So it, right. it, could be right. a, no problem. it could be a gauge Sigma model. It could be something else. At this point, at this level, I'm just okay. talking about gauge theories in the okay. abstract. No problem. No problem. All right. Thanks. No problem. Um, let's see. Right. So let me put, sort of outline an example just in terms of, uh, well, actually gauge theories, not necessarily sigma models. And then what I'm going to do after this is quickly specialize down to orbifolds, which is where I'm going to make a link to uh, the anomaly resolution procedure that I uh, mentioned in the introduction. I really am going to loop back to that, but I, you know, some introduction is required. So there's a gauge theory version of how decomposition works. Suppose I have a gauge theory with some semi-simple uh, Lie group and some finite subgroup acts trivially on all the matter of the theory. For simplicity, let's assume that that trivially acting subgroup is in the center just to you know, get around various technical issues. So the resulting theory has a one form symmetry. Now, so far, the way I've described it, it sounds just like one single quantum field theory. However, what I'm going to do is outline how from another perspective, field theories of this form are also each a disjoint union of multiple QFTs, they decompose. So how does that work? First, where are the projection operators? Let me give a very uh, sky high overview of where the projection operators are buried in this story. And then later on, as we do more concrete examples, we'll see those projection operators much more explicitly. But for the moment in broad brushstrokes, um, the projection operators, which we can think of as being built from uh, twist fields or gukov witten operators, or I'm sure they have other names depending upon different contexts. They have a mathematical understanding as elements of the center of the group algebra. Um, existence of those projectors, um, uh, well, existence of those projectors is guaranteed. It's a property of the center of the group algebra of any uh, given group. Um, existence of those projectors, uh, those projectors form a basis for the center. Their existence is ultimately a consequence of something called Wedderburn's theorem. Um, in the context of Wedderburn's theorem, the different projectors are associated with irreducible representations of K. So the different universes, the different constituent quantum field theories that arise are also associated to irreducible representations of that uh, trivially acting group. So I realize this is a sky high overview and don't worry if it doesn't make sense. We're going to see some more concrete examples of this in a few minutes, but I wanted to at least give some general picture of why this is working. So now let me sort of quickly outline at the same level of abstraction, how the partition functions work in this context. And to that end, it'll be helpful for me to restrict a little bit more. Um, so the claim for a general G gauge theory in the circumstances above is that this is going to be equivalent to a disjoint union of G mod K gauge theories with some phases that are gonna slightly modify the sum over instantons. Um, technically in my field, these are called discrete theta angles. Never mind what a discrete theta angle is. It's something that weights the different bundles, the different instanton contributions a little bit differently depending upon the instanton. So for example, a pure SU2 gauge theory in this language, at least a pure SU2 gauge theory in one plus one dimensions is the same thing as a sum of two SO3 theories, which differ from one another slightly by these uh, phase factors weighting the instantons of the theory. So perturbatively, all three of these theories are the same. The SU2, the two SO3 theories are indistinguishable from one another. The differences that I'm latching onto here are all in the non-perturbative sectors. Now, in a little more detail, part of the way the story works is that SU2 instantons are special cases of SO3 instantons. There are more SO3 instantons than SU2 instantons. However, the different phases, these different discrete theta angles, weight the non-SU2 SO3 instantons differently. So when I add these two path integrals together, the effect is essentially to cancel all of those non-SU2 SO3 instantons out of the sum. So adding together the two SO3 theories projects out some of the instantons, giving what is effectively the, the, well, the same instantons of the SU2 theory. That's part of how decomposition works. That sum over different field theories is uh, projecting out um, instantons that don't exist in the amalgamated theory. 
So let me just walk through this again very formally. Um, here I've written the partition function of the disjoint union of field theories. I've got a sum over the field theories of path integrals uh, for each of the separate field theories. Now, let me just do something basic. Let me move that sum inside the path integral. Um, I haven't done anything more than that. I've just moved that sum into there. And since it's a finite sum, you know, why not? Now, if we think about the interpretation, on the left-hand side, we have a disjoint union of field theory or the partition function of a disjoint union. On the right-hand side, this object in parentheses here is proportional to a projection operator on the allowed instantons. So this is another formal way of thinking about what I mean when I say that multiverse interference cancels out some sectors. Now, uh, put another way, schematically, what's happening in, well, the SU2 case is we have two theories combining to form a distinct third. So if we think of this yellow blob here as being one sort of amalgamated theory, the SU2 theory, I've outlined how to split it apart into two different SO3 theories. And then the fun thing is that they can be recombined to form the SU2 theory. And the parts of SO3 that don't really make sense inside SU2 cancel out by virtue of the sum. Now, I still haven't yet gotten to anomaly resolution. I'm going to soon, bear with me for a little while. I wanted to sort of motivate decomposition and explain what it is and where it comes from. Um, I wanna make the point here that decomposition has been checked in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places over the last 15 years. So don't worry if all of these things I've listed don't make sense or you're not familiar with a mirror or quantum cohomology ring. What I really wanna do is just drive home the point that there's been a lot of different papers written checking a lot of different things. So for me, uh, gauge linear sigma models are a standard tool. They have lots of things we can compute and um, decomposition can be seen explicitly there. Orbifolds I'll be talking about extensively starting in just another couple of minutes. And here we can see decomposition very explicitly. In fact, I'm going to be working through some explicit examples in orbifolds since that's going to be the uh, my go-to example for how decomposition gives a way of understanding anomaly resolution. Um, but decomposition also shows up in other places. It shows up in open, strings, open string theories and K-theoretic descriptions of open strings, as I'll briefly touch on later. In supersymmetric theories, we can see decomposition using supersymmetric localization. In non-supersymmetric theories, we can also see decomposition using uh, different tricks. Um, it's been discussed in adjoint QCD2 just, um, just last year. There was a nice paper walking through how it worked there. Uh, there have been numerical tests of uh, decomposition. Uh, you put theories on a lattice, you can see decomposition there, everything works out. And lest I give the impression otherwise, this is not just a statement about uh, theories in one plus one dimension. There are analogs in higher dimensions as well. So in particular, theories in three plus one dimensions with uh, not a one-form symmetry anymore, but now a three-form symmetry have been uh, discussed quite a bit. Furthermore, there have been a number of fun applications. Again, don't worry if none of these applications make sense to you, but you know, I, I want to make the point that there's been um, a lot of people put a lot of thought into this over the uh, last little while. Uh, there are predictions you, this implies for grimoire witten theory, which were checked by mathematicians in a series of papers starting back in 2008. There are non-perturbative constructions of geometries and gauge linear sigma models. This, I think, is probably my favorite application of, gauge, of uh, decomposition, but it is completely orthogonal to the subject of the talk today. So I'm, if you're curious, ask me later. Uh, we can see decomposition in elliptic genera. And in fact, decomposition gives a nice tool for understanding how elliptic genera of different theories relate to one another. And what I'll be talking about today Decomposition can be applied to think about anomaly resolution procedures. Okay, <clears throat> so my goal today is to apply decomposition, which I've been outlining, to an anomaly resolution uh, procedure in finite gauge theories described by, uh, well, um, one of our audience members and Wen and Witten back uh, just a few years ago. And my go-to examples for this are going to be what are called orbifolds. Now, an orbifold is a finite gauge theory. Um, it's a it's a basically a sigma model in some target space um, in which we have gauged some finite group. Now, let me explain what that means. What, what's an orbifold? 
Well, an ordinary sigma model is simply a, a path integral over maps into some space. So here, schematically, sigma is my space time. The path integral for uh, an ordinary sigma model just sums over these maps um, weighted by you know, schematically the area of the image. When we gauge a finite group, um, a finite group that acts on X, what we do is we identify field configurations related by G. So in an orbifold, what that means is we allow for branch cuts defined by elements of G. So for example, if my two-dimensional space-time is a two-torus, then whereas an ordinary sigma model would only sum over maps from a two-torus into that space, in an orbifold, I'm also going to include contributions where I introduce branch cuts on the two-torus. So what I've, I've tried to draw that schematically here, you should think about the square as being a, um, a two-torus or as being what you'll get is being a two-torus if I identify sides. So if I identify this side and this side, um, and the two uh, and the other two sides, then what I get is a, a two torus. What I've done is essentially introduce a pair of branch cuts on that two torus to sort of open up that two torus into a square. And I'm considering maps into X where the image of this side and the image of this side are related to one another by G and the image of this side and the image of this side are related to one another by H. So that's a bit more mechanically what it means to have um, for to gauge a finite group action in a sigma model. And that's, that's what an orbifold is. And again, if, if this doesn't make perfect sense, uh, to some extent, much of what I'll be saying is independent of these details. So in particular, the details of X and the details of sigma models more generally aren't really specifically relevant to either decomposition or anomaly resolution. Um, I use them to give this talk a concrete underpinning, but on the other hand, everything I'm going to have to say is going to make sense in greater generality. So if it's helpful, whenever I talk about orbifolds, just think about finite gauge theories and um, you, won't go, you won't go too far wrong. The, the details of these spaces, the details of sigma models won't enter into my considerations. Really, I'm just gonna be making statements about finite gauge theories, and then talking about orbifolds because it gives me a set of concrete examples I can work through. So um, anomaly resolution. I've spent a lot of time talking about decomposition, but I haven't really said anything about anomaly resolution yet. So the, the idea of Wang Wen Witten, or at least uh, the way I think about uh, their paper or your paper, since one of the authors is here, is that in if a given orbifold is ill-defined because of an anomaly, so if I have some anomaly which obstructs the gauging of that finite group G, then their idea is replace G with a bigger group whose action is anomaly-free. So that means, for example, that the pullback of the anomaly has to vanish. I'll, I'll spell that out in more detail later. But I think this is the, the central idea. We replace, if we have one orbifold that doesn't make sense because the group we're trying to gauge has an anomaly, make the group bigger. Now that larger group has some subgroup. We need to specify how gamma acts on the space, not just G. And the idea is that we take that subgroup K that we extended uh, G by to act trivially on X. Then the original group, the anomalous group is simply the quotient of gamma by this normal subgroup K. And since K acts trivially, that then enables us to define the action of gamma on X. We just take in any given gamma element, we project down to G and then act on it X by that element. Now, orbifolds with, so this is the Wang-Wen Wang Witten procedure in a nutshell. However, orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups are standard examples in which decomposition arises. After all, these are gauge theories with a trivially acting subgroup. So one expects that decomposition is going to be relevant here. And that's really what my talk today is going to be about. What I'm going to do is elaborate on what decomposition means for orbifolds. And then I'm going to apply decomposition to um, uh, these particular cases to see exactly uh, what's going on. And what we'll get in the end is a nice understanding of why the wang witten procedure works. Uh, we'll see, well, um, bear with me. I think the next slide is going to cover this a bit more. So my plan for the next while is to uh, first describe decomposition in orbifolds specifically. I've outlined it in general terms. Uh, let, me, let me finish up the outline and then I'll get to the question. 
Um, uh, let me describe the decomposition in orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups. I'm then going to add a new modular invariant phase, which turns out to be required in the setting of orbifolds to um, uh, make this fly. Then I'm going to review this anomaly resolution procedure, and I'm going to apply decomposition to that procedure. And the upshot, what I'm finally going to find, and what I'll elaborate on at the end of the talk, is that the field theory we get by following the wang witten procedure, by expanding the original orbifold group to something bigger, and turning on suitable phases to make everything work, is the same thing as, well, copies and covers of orbifolds of X by non-anomalous subgroups. So the fact we get non-anomalous subgroups over here means that uh, this theory, we can say that this that this theory is explicitly anomaly-free. This, this gives us a simple understanding of why the wang wen witten procedure works. So uh, you had a question. I don't know if I answered it. Yes. The question is that, uh, what's the, do you have any constraint on the target space X? Uh, just make sure whether, whether there are some statement about X in your theory. No, not, no. not really. Um, um, every, everything I'm going to be doing is really a statement about the group. Now, I, you know, that said, um, for, to get any, partic any particular anomaly will depend upon the details of the group action and the space. So if I vary the space or vary the group action, that'll change what I mean by the anomaly. But for the analysis I'm doing, I'm really just going to be manipulating this more just at a, higher, at a somewhat higher level. The details of X won't enter. Um, the particular anomaly will enter as expressed as an element of group cohomology. But beyond that, um, the details of X are irrelevant. In fact, the fact I have an orbifold is, for some purposes, also irrelevant. I, I'm going to actually compute partition functions at a very schematic level. But, uh, but really, the details of X and the details of the group action on X are not relevant, except insofar as they determine the anomaly. The analysis I'm going to be doing is really all about um, what to do once you have an anomaly, or at least that's that's where I'm eventually going to go with that. Okay, no problem. So I suppose the understanding for whether there are some additional uh, statement of, or constraint on X will be case by case analysis depends on anomalies. That's fine. That's right. That's exactly it. Yeah, for at, at this level, th this particular statement will not impose any additional constraints on X. Um, of course, you may want other properties to hold true. Um, you know. Yeah, but but uh, this sort of statement is going to be universal in the sense that uh, this is going to hold for any X. And in fact, I mean, to some extent, this is going to hold for any finite gauge theory. Uh, the fact I have an orbifold is not specifically relevant, except insofar as all the actual computations I'm going to do will be in orbifolds. But uh, this is really a statement about finite gauge theories. So, so I suppose just since I asked, so no, I suppose it's all good. Yeah. One, one simple example that uh, has application to one plus one D quantum spin chains, or maybe some dimension reduction mm -hmm. of a, a three plus one D yang -Mil theory compared mm -hmm. by Torus is that the target mm -hmm. space can become, uh, for example, to this uh, complex projective uh, space CPN mm -hmm. minus one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And in, in that case, I wonder whether there's any example story that you have when X is maybe CP, CPN minus one or something like that. Um, I, I don't have any, I'm not going to say anything about that particular projective space. I'm not going to say anything about that particular projective space, but, but one, uh, you know, give me an hour after the talk. I'm sure I can dig up some, some more relevant facts. It's uh, at the level, at the level I'll be talking about today, this is all going to, to happen at a higher level. Um, okay. um, but, okay. but uh, yeah, in particular examples, more can be said. Um, yeah, in particular examples, more can be said. All right, thanks. Uh huh. No problem. All right. So, what do I mean by decomposition in orbifolds? Um, so, as I said, I'm going to begin by discussing um, decomposition in orbifolds, and then I'm going to get to anomaly resolution and how to apply decomposition to give this sort of nice, simple picture of why the wang witten procedure is uh, working, or at least to me, it gives some insight into uh, why it works. So let me begin discussing ordinary orbifolds. Eventually, I'm going to need to add some extra phases to these orbifolds. I'm going to, need to modify these finite gauge theories a little bit. But for the moment, let me start with the basic case and build up. So let's consider an orbifold, um, a finite gauge theory involving a gauge group capital gamma. And let's suppose some subgroup of gamma, some finite subgroup of gamma acts trivially. 
Um, so this subgroup need not be central. Um, yeah, it need not be central. In this case, there's a simple statement of decomposition. Uh, the orbifold, this gamma gauge theory, uh, this gamma uh, gauge theory is equivalent to, uh, well, it may not be completely obvious, but this is really a sum of G gauge theories. So in this, uh, on this side of the equation, K hat is a set of isomorphism classes of irreducible representations of K. So it's some discrete set. And the fact that it's a discrete set means eventually we're going to get um, copies. That's the reason why we're going to get a disjoint union on this side of the equation. Now, this group G, uh, certainly it acts on X, but it also acts on the set of irreducible representations. Given any one representation of K, I can conjugate any incoming element by lifts of elements of G to get what might be a different representation of K. It has to be in the same dimension, but it could potentially be a different representation. So G can act non-trivially on K hat in general. And this little omega hat I referred to here are some extra phases that will weight the different sectors of the orbifold uh, by well, phases. Um, they're called discrete torsion. I'll explain what they are later. For the moment, I'm gonna keep them there just as a reminder that there are some phases that enter into the different universes into the construction of the orbifolds on, on this side of the equation. Now, um, if K is in the center, we can simplify this a little bit. If K is actually in the center, then that action of G on K hat that I outlined is trivial because I can conjugate by lifts, I can conjugate elements of K by any lift of an element of G and nothing will happen. So in this case, decomposition specializes to this much simpler form. Um, basically the G acts trivially on K hat. So we just get orbifolds of X by G, um, K hat copies. That's, that's all I mean by uh, this notation here, a disjoint union of orbifolds by G, as many elements as K hat. And more generally, we get both copies and covers. Um, if G acts non-trivially on K hat, then instead of getting just copies of X mod G, we'll get a cover of X mod G as we'll see later. Now the different universes I spoke of, the summands of decomposition, then basically correspond to orbits of the G action on K hat. I'm going to give explicit formulas for projectors and omega hat and all that in a few minutes. Um, before doing that, let me mention boundaries also decompose. So far, I've just talked about the, the bulk degrees of freedom in a one plus one dimensional theory. But for example, you could imagine adding fermions along the confined to the boundary of one of those one dimensional theories. Um, although K acts trivially on the bulk degrees of freedom, it might act non-trivially on the boundary degrees of freedom. And so that gives us some way of distinguishing the different boundary degrees of freedom. In particular, um, we can um, use that to compute which universe a given boundary lies in. We take the gamma action on that boundary, we restrict it to that subgroup K, at which point the gamma action just reduces to a representation of K on the degrees of freedom. And then we compare orbits and the different universes, the different components in the uh, decomposition correspond to orbits in K hat. So I, I'm not gonna do anything with boundaries today, but I wanted to mention that there is a picture of how boundaries work in decomposition. Um, just a quick aside before going on, um, this has a math understanding. So these boundaries can often be understood in terms of a mathematical object called K-theory, which I'm not certain if people here are familiar with or not. Um, this boundary decomposition reflects the math of K-theory. So technically this orbifold of X by gamma is an example of a K-gerb on X mod G, essentially a fiber bundle, which the fibers look like groups of one form symmetries. And it's a fun math fact that the K-theory of a gerb is a disjoint union of the K-theories of the underlying spaces or orbifolds following in exactly the same fashion as I've described for decomposition. In other words, this decomposition I've been talking about gives a simple physical explanation for this possibly obscure fact about um, mathematics, this possibly obscure fact about K-theory. All right, now, X mod D4, <clears throat> let's, work the, let's walk through all the details and one nice, simple example. Try, try to hopefully make this less abstract. So D4, by D4, I mean the eight element dihedral group. I'll elaborate in a couple of minutes. Let's assume this group has center Z mod two, 
let's assume that z mod 2 acts trivially on x. So as a result, this theory has a bz2, a one-form symmetry. Now, if I take d4 and quotient out by that trivially acting subgroup, what I get is just a z2 cross z2. So it's reasonable to expect that this orbifold should be closely related to a z2 cross z2 orbifold. And then what decomposition predicts from, for example, the formula I showed you a few minutes ago, is that the field theory of that D4 orbifold should be a disjoint union of the field theories of a pair of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds, albeit with slightly different phases weighting the, the non-perturbative sectors, slightly different choices of what's called technically discrete torsion in, in my neck of the woods. So let's walk through this, check through this explicitly. So first off, I said way back when that the first property of a decomposition is that there exist projectors. So what are the projectors here? Well, in this orbifold, there exists local dimension zero operators associated to even the trivially acting group elements. Let me let Z hat denote that dimension zero twist field associated to the trivially acting generator or to the generator of the trivially acting Z2. It's straightforward to show that that operator z hat has this OPE. It, it squares to the identity. And using that relation, you can build these two projection operators. Um, using this identity, it is straightforward to check that uh, this quantity here has all the right properties. Um, each of these pi plus minuses squares to itself. The product of two different pi's is zero. And then I didn't write it, but it's also easy to check that the sum of these pi's is equal to the identity. The z hats cancel out when I sum over pi plus and pi minus. So we have projectors. Since we have projectors, we expect the theory to fall apart in, into two pieces. Now let's see if we can figure out what those two pieces are and compare to the prediction of decomposition. And to do that, I'm going to compute the partition functions of these theories. So let's compute the partition function of that D4 orbifold. To do so, it'll be helpful for me to enumerate the elements of the, of the dihedral group. So certainly it has the identity. I've already mentioned that Z generates the center. It also has elements, call them A and B. I can multiply either of those elements by the generator of the center, plus I have their product AB, plus I can talk about BA, the product in the opposite order. It's not quite the same as AB. It differs by an element of the center. Let's furthermore take the one plus one dimensional space time to be a two torus and think about the partition function. Now, formally, the partition function of such an orbifold on a two torus is just a sum over, or it's well, weighted by one over the order of the orbifold group times a sum over sigma models from these two tori with branch cuts into X. So again, these are, the idea behind this picture is that this is a path integral over maps um, maps into X over um, from a two torus with branch cuts, meaning that this side of the square gets identified with this side of the square only up to the action of G. The bottom side of the square only gets identified with the top side up to the action of H. So if G and H are both the identity, this is just a map from a two torus into X, the ordinary, an ordinary map from a two torus into X. If G and H are not the identity, then this is something a little bit potentially more complicated. Furthermore, in order for these branch cuts to close in the corners, I'm, only go I'm going to require that G and H commute with one another. If they don't commute, then this figure, this picture doesn't actually make sense. The, uh, these two sides don't quite meet in one point, they, they meet in two points. So to talk about these as branch cuts on a two torus, uh, these group elements have to commute. Now I'm going to argue that the, that the partition function, that this partition function of the D4 orbifold is a sum of partition functions of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds. Now, uh, so uh, formally the partition function of the D4 orbifold has that form there. Now, since Z acts trivially, these ZHs are symmetric under multiplying either G or H by elements of that center. So the contribution from this square is the same as the contribution from that square and from that square and from that square, all because Z does nothing. So I can relate these squares to one another by multiplying in squares like this. Now, each of these squares basically corresponds to an isomorphism class of D4 bundles. 
Each of these red squares corresponds to an isomorphism class of Z mod two bundles on the two torus. And what I'm doing schematically is showing how to map from, uh, how to interchange non-perturbative sectors in the D4 gauge theory by tensoring in uh, Z mod two bundles. So in other words, this is the BZ21 form symmetry that I mentioned earlier, written explicitly. This is the reason why, this is the good reason why uh, this particular theory has this thing called a one form symmetry. It's because these different non perturbative contributions to the partition function all are weighted the same. And the good reason for that is just that Z acts trivially. So, so far, so good. Now, where does the decomposition come from? So, each of the D4 twisted sectors that appears is the same as a Z2 cross Z2 twisted sector. I can just project down to elements of Z2 cross Z2. Um, they appear with some multiplicity, but there's one important catch. Not every Z2 cross Z2 sector will appear inside the D4 orbifold. In particular, these sectors in a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold do not appear inside the D4 orbifold. The reason is that they, these group elements do not lift to commuting pairs inside D4. So here I have an A bar and a B bar inside Z2 cross Z2. Z2 cross Z2 is abelian, everything commutes there. However, upstairs inside D4, um, A bar and B bar would lift to, for example, A and B, but A and B don't commute with one another as elements of D4, and the partition function only sums over commuting group elements. So because the partition function only sums over commuting elements and these pairs do not lift to commuting elements inside D4, these sectors don't appear. So going back to the general terms I was waving around, uh, hand waving about at the beginning, this is an example of a restriction on non-perturbative sectors. These sectors are the non-perturbative contributions to this D4 gauge theory. Now, uh, let me, uh, so let's summarize what we know so far about the partition function of this, D2, of this D4 orbifold. Um, up to factors, it's basically the same as the partition function of a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold, except that we have to subtract some stuff off. And when we look carefully about those, fa those factors, we find we get a factor of two. So let me pause at this moment to emphasize, this means this theory is different from a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. Physics knows, when we gauge even a trivially acting group. Now, nowadays, I think people understand this. This may not be so strange, but I think for the first 10 years I was giving talks on this subject, uh, this was sort of the first question I would ask or get asked, uh, Z2 acts trivially. How can gauging a trivially acting group make any difference for the physics? How can physics possibly tell that you gauged a group that doesn't do anything? And this, I think is a nice answer to that question. This makes it very clear that although in this D4 gauge theory, although the Z2 did nothing at all, when we gauge it, we still generate a different quantum field theory. There's still some, uh, simply because the partition functions don't match and not just because of some factor, they really don't match. Now, um, Discrete torsion phases. Let's now start wrapping or tying this into decomposition. Given any one partition function uh, like this, uh, we can multiply in uh, certain SL2Z invariant phases. The SL2Z comes about from Dane twist in the torus. Uh, I'll explain more later. Suffice to say, given any one partition function, there exist phases I can multiply in to get another partition function for a different theory. Um, there's a universal choice of such phases. Um, they're determined by elements of this group cohomology group. And these choices are referred to as discrete torsion, at least in, in my neck of the woods. Now in particular, in a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold, so discrete tor the choice of discrete torsion is an element of this group cohomology group, but that's just Z2. And the non-trivial element, the non-trivial choice of discrete torsion acts as a sign on these Z2 cross Z2 sectors, which were exactly the sectors that were omitted before. So now if I take this expression for the partition function as being uh, of the, of, for the partition function of the D4 orbifold as being a, something that's similar to a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold, but minus some sectors. Now what I can do is realize that that partition function is really the sum of a pair of the partition functions of a pair of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds, one with discrete torsion and one without. 
Um, adding those two, when we add those two partition functions together, the contribution, the sectors that um, get different phases from the choice of discrete torsion cancel one another out between these two sums. What we're left with is the partition function of just the, the D4 gauge theory. So adding the universes together projects out some sectors. This is a, an interference effect between the two universes of the decomposition. Any questions about that while I uh, I'll get something to drink? Okay. So in particular, this now matches the prediction of decomposition. I started with a D4 orbital fold, and just at the level of partition functions, I've seen that this, uh, at least the statement of partition functions is consistent with the statement that this D4 gauge theory is the same as a sum of two Z2 cross C2 theories, each with different values of discrete torsion. Now there's more stuff you should check, right? That's just the partition function on a two torus. So, um, you know, it turns out this is, you can also repeat the same computation on higher genus Riemann surface, on higher genus Riemann surfaces. Uh, there's more combinatorics. I do not want to try to do that in a talk. It's just gross, but it's very straightforward. Um, you can look in this paper here to see the details. Uh, there's the only slightly novel thing that pops up is that in general, one finds what are called uh, dilettante shifts, which mostly I'm going to suppress in this talk. I'll come back to those um, a little bit later. Um, another point, I mentioned that the one form symmetry, this BZ2 shows up in permutations of the non-perturbative sectors. It also shows up in this algebraic relation obeyed by the dimension zero twist field. Um, in a language that may or may not be familiar, this is Z hat is essentially the gukov witten operator for that trivially acting Z2 in this finite gauge theory. And this algebra is another way of expressing the fact that we have a BZ2. Uh, I'll talk some more about that later. Now, another example. Um, in fact, um, um, uh, I, this is taking me a bit longer than I thought. So let me go through the next example a bit quickly. So I've got, I have notes here for another example where something slightly different happens. Um, I can consider an orbifold of some space by the eight element group of unit quaternions. So which I've denoted with this bold face H. And now let's let the Z4 subgroup generated by the quaternion I act trivially. Now the quaternions have center Z2. This is a Z4. So this subgroup is not in the center anymore. And so as a result, we're no longer going to get quite such a simple decomposition as what we had before. Instead, we have something slightly more complicated. We have um, two universes that look like X mod Z2, one universe that's just X. And because I'm running a little bit short on time, uh, let me just say one can write down projectors and one can check partition functions. Um, and there exist one form symmetries that you can use to understand this, but my time is running a bit uh, short. So let me be brief. Um, now that we've seen some concrete examples, let me quickly relate that back to the general picture I gave earlier. So I said earlier that decomposition predict, predicts that a gamma orbifold should decompose in this fashion. Well, if we go back and look at X mod D4, in this case, G is Z2 cross Z2. Um, it acts trivially on the K hats. So K hat just factors out of that quotient. And the right-hand side of this equation is just two copies of X mod Z2 cross Z2 together with some choices of discrete torsion, um, which I'm gonna gloss over for the moment. Similarly, in the H orbifold, um, here there's a Z2, or here G is just a Z2, but it acts non-trivially on K hat. It interchanges two of the irreps, leaving two others invariant. These two universes correspond to the two irreps that are invariant under G. This one corresponds to two irreps that are exchanged by G. So schematically, if K hat is Z4, G is a Z2, if G, that Z2 exchanges these two elements, then one of the universes is going to end up looking like a double cover of X mod Z2. And you can check that the two Z2s cancel one another out, so you just get a copy of X. So that's how these two examples fit into this general framework. Um, one can write down projectors um, in general. Um, if I write the 
uh, orbit, any one orbit of G as a sum of irreducible representations in K, then uh, the projector corresponding to that orbit can be written very generally in that fashion. Um, so one can write down projectors and check that they have all the right properties. That's straightforward to do. Um, I haven't yet told you where the omega hats come from, and I doubt I'm going to have the time. So let me just sort of quickly page through uh, the next couple of slides. There is a, a um, um, there's some math you can do to understand where those omega hats come from. And if anyone's really curious, you're welcome to ask me about it at the end and I can come back and explain this in detail. I have a couple of slides here designed to outline these details. Um, the most important thing is perhaps the comment at the bottom. You don't need this level of detail for the talk. Don't worry about these details, but I wanted to stress that this level of detail does exist. I'm not making some arbitrary choices. This isn't something that was sort of pulled out of thin air and happens to work, but rather you can develop this theory in a very systematic fashion and make just on a purely mathematical basis, some very straightforward predictions for how decomposition should work. And when I'm, my goal here was to just make it clear that one really can, that those details really do exist. All right, so far I've outlined how decomposition works in orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups and no discrete torsion or other phase modifications. Now, in order to apply this to anomaly resolution, which is where I still want to go, we have to understand decomposition in more general cases in orbifolds modified by modular invariant phases. Now, this next case, um, I don't really have the time for, but let me see if I can outline the basics. So let's consider an orbifold in which I've turned on discrete torsion. Um, now there's uh, still a decomposition, but the details are somewhat more complicated. They break up into cases. If the restriction of discrete torsion to K is non-trivial, then I can write down a formula for the universes that has the same form as what I described earlier. If the restriction of the discrete torsion to K is trivial, but the image under this map beta is non-zero, then there's still a decomposition, and it can, but now it's written in terms of the image of discrete torsion under beta. And if the restriction to K is trivial and beta vanishes, then um, the discrete torsion is a pullback of some discrete torsion in the G orbifold, and its effect is just to shift the discrete torsion on each of the components. Um, otherwise, this decomposition looks an awful lot like the, the one we had before. And then one can build projectors. Um, and suffice to say, in one plus one dimensions, we've got a pretty good handle on how this stuff works. Um, yeah, because I touched on topological field theories at the beginning, let me quickly run through those now. Let me consider the following special case. An orbifold of a point by G, possibly with discrete torsion. Now, decomposition predicts that the field theory of the orbifold of a point is just a disjoint union of field theories of points, as many copies as projective irreducible representations of the group, up to what I'm calling overall dilettante shifts. Now, in mathematics, this is a general property of the center of the twisted group algebra. Um, that center has a basis corresponding to twist fields and another basis corresponding to projectors. They are all linear combinations of one another. Um, QF, this field theory of a point is an example of what Dan Fried likes to call an invertible field theory. It's a, a completely uh, trivial theory. A sigma model into a point has um, a one dimensional fog. It basically has a vacuum and no other states in its fox space. We can multiply the vacuum by a scalar and that's about all we can do with it. The action is entirely classical. It has no propagating fields. It's, a, it's the next best thing to trivial. Now, as it happens, I mentioned this example because it is also an example of a two-dimensional unitary topological field theory. Specifically, this is the same as two-dimensional dicraft witten theory. So part of what I'm telling you is that two-dimensional dicraft witten theory decomposes. And in fact, there's a similar statement for other two-dimensional topological field theories. So um, here I've walked through uh, some details. I wrote out the partition function on a genus G Riemann surface, which confirms that uh, the theory decomposes, but I'm running short on time. So let me quickly move on. Um, similar statements are true for other theories, abelian BF theory, the G mod G model, two-dimensional pure Young Mills, they all decompose. And in fact, they all decompose into these invertible field theories. 
The formal reason is simply semi-simplicity of the Frobenius algebra, which implies not only the projectors exist, but that all local operators are linear combinations of those projectors. So I can take that theory and completely decompose it down into a sum of trivial theories. Um, let me run with abelian BF for just a little bit longer because there's something fun here. So this is a U1 gauge theory whose action is just B times F up to an integer called the level. It has two sets of local operators, uh, two sets of operators. There are K local operators, which just look like exponentials of powers of B. It also has K Wilson lines, which are just well, integers times polynomials of A. One can compute clock shift commutation relations between these local operators and the Wilson lines. And one can build a set of projectors in that theory as one should in any two dimensional topological field theory. I think there's a, someone worked out in 93 that all two dimensional topological field, all two dimensional unitary topological field theories emit projectors of one sort or another. Now, before I go on, the point I wanna make is that these clock shift commutation relations imply a fun relation between the projectors and the Wilson lines. I can move a projector through a Wilson line, but it changes the projector. In other words, the Wilson lines in this picture, the Wilson lines in, uh, in abelian BF theory act as defects connecting different universes, which is another general feature of decomposition. The boundaries are associated to particular universes. Things like Wilson lines become defects joining, uh, connecting different universes. So uh, there's a lot of fun stuff in here, which I don't have the time to walk through. Um, and again, this is a general feature of all two-dimensional unitary topological and near topological field theories like pure Yang mills. All right, anomaly resolution. Uh, my goal today was to talk about anomaly resolution, but so far I spent most of my time talking about decomposition. Um, so recall the idea in anomaly resolution is that given an anomalous ill-defined orbifold by G, we're going to replace G by some larger finite group and then add some phases. Now, because gamma has a subgroup that acts trivially, for the reasons I've just described, an orbifold by gamma will decompose. It's equivalent to copies and covers of X mod G. But getting copies of X mod G is not going to be helpful because the whole point is that X mod G was anomalous. So there are also some phases that have to be added in that I mentioned here um, in order to get this to work. So in particular, one has to introduce some new, uh, what are somewhat new for the orbifold literature, uh, modular invariant phases called quantum symmetries. Um, what the quantum symmetries do is give you a way of, they basically, um, there's something new that can happen when you have an orbifold in which a subgroup acts trivially. They're classified by elements of this group called homology group, which can be written more simply as homomorphisms from G into your epsilon K. And their effect is to act on twisted sector states by phases, as I've illustrated schematically here. So there's a lot that can be said. Um, sometimes these quantum symmetries are equivalent to discrete torsion. Um, there's a relationship between the group cohomology group in which they live and some others. Um, in particular, if the element, if the quantum symmetry in here is the image of an element of beta, then that particular quantum symmetry is determined by discrete torsion. And this ties into an old story, which I'm not gonna have the time to get through. So let me move on. Um, for the purposes of resolving anomalies, we need to pick a B inside degree one cohomology whose image under this map is non-trivial. Basically what we're going to want to do is pick a quantum symmetry lying in here, whose image under this differential is the anomaly and degree three cohomology. Now, quantum symmetries are also in independent of interest beyond anomaly resolution, but these are the cases I'm mostly going to be interested in. Um, let me quickly distinguish them from discrete torsion. Um, they're both modular invariant, which means they're both going to be invariant under Dane twists of a two torus in which I slice a two torus along one axis and then pull it apart and then rotate and stick it back together. So those sorts of operations are classified by SL2Z. Um, under such a twist, they'll take a twisted sector like this and turn it into a twisted sector like this, where A, B, C, and D are elements of SL2Z. Now, the difference, one of the differences between discrete torsion and a quantum symmetry, in discrete torsion, the phases uh, that multiply twisted sectors are invariant under these Dane twists. In quantum symmetries, 
the epsilons themselves are not invariant, but when you average over all the elements of K, the result is invariant, and that's enough to get modular invariance to work. So quantum symmetries are modular invariant, but in a different way than discrete torsion, which is a fun story for me as someone who's thought a lot about orbifolds over the years. Now, decomposition in theories with such phases can be expressed pretty simply. Um, the field theory of a gamma orbifold in which you've turned on a quantum symmetry is the same as this. Um, a quotient by the kernel of B of X cross uh, the irreps of the co-kernel of B. And furthermore, this is more or less uniquely determined by consistency with uh, what I've described earlier. So earlier I described decomposition in a gamma orbifold with discrete torsion. Um, I, in fact, there I described decomposition in this form. If for this to be consistent, we need this to reduce to this in the special case that B is equal to beta. And indeed that works out perfectly. So um, there's some examples, but I'm running a bit short on time. Um, for example, if I take a, just take, start with, suppose I take G to be Z2 and extend it to Z4. I can pick a non-trivial B. So B lives in homomorphisms from Z2 to Z2. There's a Z mod two's worth such things. If I pick the non-trivial element, both the kernel and co-kernel of B will all vanish. So this statement predicts the field theory of that gamma orbifold with a quantum symmetry should be the same as the field theory of just X itself. And indeed that's easy to check in partition functions. Um, if I compute the partition function of on a two torus of that Z4 gauge theory, then I'll get a sum like this. Um, the quantum symmetry acts so as to relate these sectors by phases as so, which means for example, that all the sectors with either I or J odd will cancel out and all the sectors in which both are even are all equivalent to Z zero zero. So the partition function of this orbifold is the same as the partition function of no orbifold at all, or just the partition function on X. So this has nothing to do with X. This is really just a, a manipulations of this finite group gauge theory. The details of X play no role here or essentially in anything else I've talked about today. And in particular, this decomposition is verified in that case. And then there are more complicated cases. Let me move on. So let me apply this to anomalies. Um, um, so anomalies in this talk, in a finite G gauge theory in N plus one dimensions where we classify by degree N plus two cohomology. Um, if I had time, I would begin by explaining how this works in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, there's a fun way to understand um, what's going on. I guess um, uh, briefly, <sighs> I guess maybe I do have the time to do this a little bit more. So suppose I have a finite group that acts on the states of some quantum mechanical system. So for any state of that quantum mechanical system, I get a new state defined by multiplying that state by some operator rho of G. Now for an honest group action, would, we would require that rho of G times rho of H be the same as rho of G H, that um, the action of lifting to a row commutes with the multiplication inside the group. However, in quantum mechanics, we only care about states up to phases. So instead of getting this, we might instead get something a bit more complicated where this omega GH is some extra U1 phase that pops up. After all, we only care about states up to phases. What do we care if um, this is true only up to some extra phase? Now, if we demand associativity, that places a constraint on the omegas, which corresponds to the co-close condition for um, elements of discrete torsion uh, for elements of group cohomology. And furthermore, if we multiply each of the rows by a phase, by a group dependent phase, that's going to change the omegas by what's called a co-boundary in the language of group cohomology. So as an upshot, these omegas are classified by elements of degree two group cohomology. So this is an example of an anomaly in a zero plus one dimensional theories. This is to my mind, sort of a nice prototype for the story that anomalies have um, are arising from or can be understood from uh, group cohomology. And then if there is such an obstruction, the states are all in projective representations of the orbifold group. Oh, yeah.
there's a fix we can apply to make that to improve that quantum mechanical system. We can extend, so in the spirit of Wang Wenwen's work, we can extend that group G to a larger group gamma for which the states are in an honest representation. So this is really a two-step process. First, we need to pick an extension such that the pullback of omega is trivial. And then we need to define the action of gamma. And to do that, we're going to have to pick some element A, which is in this cohomology group. And then we're going to deform those lifts rho to um, a rho twiddle consisting of the product of the original rows by some extra phases defined by the A's. And then you can show that the rho twiddles define an honest representation of gamma as opposed to some projective representation. So then inside, uh, in terms of the action of gamma, the states are now in an honest representation of gamma. The anomaly has been removed in this quantum mechanical theory. Now, so the anomaly was fixed. So again, the prototype was we extend, we extend the original G to a larger group gamma, and then we define the action of gamma by picking some A inside some suitable group that adds the phases needed to um, uh, lift the group action properly. Now, this was just quantum mechanics, but the, the observation of Wang Wen Witten, at least the, the way I think about the observation of Wang Wen Witten, is that the same pattern applies in higher dimensions. So let's look next at what happens in one plus one dimensions. So let's suppose we have an orbifold X mod G, which is anomalous. So meaning this orbifold doesn't really make sense. We're trying to gauge that G, but we can't, there's an obstruction. So what do we do? First step is we make G bigger. We replace G with some extension gamma um, where gamma is chosen such that the pullback of the anomaly is trivial. And then the idea is we replace this original orbifold with a gamma orbifold. But to do that, I need to explain how gamma acts on X. So let's try the most basic thing. Let's suppose this K acts completely trivially on the theory and I do nothing else. I don't add any new phases, I do nothing. Then unfortunately we haven't accomplished much. So decomposition implies, if this is a central extension, that um, a gamma orbifold of X is the same as just copies of G orbifolds of X. So if this had an anomaly, and I don't add a phase, I haven't actually accomplished anything. I've just got um, uh, this gamma orbifold has the same problem as a G orbifold, but, but we can fix this. And we fix it in the same fashion that I outlined in the quantum mechanical theory. We add some phases. So there's a second step. We turn on a quantum symmetry, which lives in this group cohomology group, which is chosen so that its image under that differential D2 is the anomaly. It turns out that if the anomaly is the image of some B like so, then the pullback of the anomaly to gamma is automatically trivial. So now in this case, in this presentation, K acts trivially on the space, but non-trivially on the twisted sector states via the action of that quantum symmetry. And then these two together, the extension plus B resolve the anomaly. So this is how I think about the, the Wang Wen Witten procedure. And I apologize to uh, the first W of WWW who is in the audience. I hopefully have not uh, distorted the way you, you've thought about this uh, too much. This is at least my take on, on your paper. Oh, I think the description is correct. Perfect. Yes, it is perfect. Good. Well, thanks. Thank you for summarizing. Excellent. Now, um, you might ask, why does this work? This is basically where I came into this um, a while back. You know, I saw this and thought, okay, this is great, but what's actually going on physically? Can I, how can I understand how the anomaly procedure is working? And furthermore, because this construction involves trivially gauging a trivially acting subgroup, this just you know, cries out to me as a regime in which decomposition can be applied. And now having built up all this technology, we can apply decomposition and get to a result very quickly. So again, the procedure is we replace the G orbifold with a gamma orbifold with some extra phases where the phases are chosen such that their image under that differential is the anomaly. Now decomposition implies for any orbifold with a trivially acting subgroup with some quantum symmetry, that this field theory is the same as this field theory. So this, I've just lifted this from earlier results. I, I'm not, in this particular line, I'm not using anything about the anomaly per se, 
All I'm saying is, okay, we have a gamma orbifold. It has a quantum symmetry. That's the same as this orbifold with some you know, discrete torsion factors on each of the universes. Furthermore, um, because the anomaly is the image of B under a differential, that implies immediately that if I restrict the anomaly to the kernel of B, well, that restriction is automatically zero. So that means that the kernel of B is automatically anomaly free. So by construction, this side has no anomaly. So I'm going to walk through some examples in a moment, but this is the quick reason for why decomposition gives a way of understanding why the, the wang wetten witten procedure works. This is a quick way of understanding why you get an anomaly-free theory, because when you rewrite this using decomposition, um, the universes it decomposes into all are explicitly anomaly-free. Now, uh, let's walk through some examples. So let's consider, uh, first off, let's go back to that D4 orbifold I mentioned earlier, that eight element dihedral group. So again, this is an extension of Z2 cross Z2 to Z2. So here, um, I want to imagine an anomaly. So here I'm going to imagine that, I, that there's an anomaly in this orbifold. The anomaly lives in degree three cohomology of Z2 cross Z2. Now that group cohomology group turns out to be Z2 cubed. Uh, you can think of those three Z2s as corresponding to the three Z2 subgroups of Z2 cross Z2. There's a subgroup generated by A, a subgroup generated by B, and then actually another subgroup generated by the product of A and B simultaneously. So the anomaly lives somewhere in here. Now, um, what I've done in this table is sort of list all options for this particular extension. Um, the quantum symmetry will be determined by its image on the A and B in Z2 cross Z2. So there are basically four possibilities for the quantum symmetry, which I've listed on this side of the table. In this column, I've listed the result of actually computing the image of that differential. So this is going to be the anomaly that's resolved. So for these first two entries, no anomaly is resolved. The image of the differential is trivial, so we can't actually use either of these choices to resolve anything. In the first case, that's uh, sort of clear. This actually corresponds to the trivial case. This is the case of no non-trivial quantum symmetry. So naturally, this is not going to resolve anything. This one is a little bit more surprising. We've turned on a non-trivial quantum symmetry, but D2 annihilates it. So, sorry, uh, no anomalies resolved. And when we look at the possible components, when we look at what decomposition implies, we find you know, there's a little more, there's some other options because we could also turn on discrete torsion inside D4. Um, but suffice to say, for both of these two examples, there exist, um, choices of discrete torsion for which you get G orbifolds. So this can't resolve any anomalies. And since we're getting G orbifolds over here and the G orbifolds were anomalous, well, it's no surprise, nothing is being resolved. These two cases are a bit more interesting. Here, for these two, cho for these two choices of quantum symmetry, um, there is an anomaly we can resolve. For these two choices, the image of the differential is non-trivial. It corresponds to the B subgroup of that Z2 cubed. So if your anomaly happens to lie in here, then that anomaly can be resolved. And if we look at the prediction for decomposition, again, the decomposition itself is not really speaking about anomalies. This is just a general statement about gamma orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups and quantum symmetries. I've just taken the general story from earlier and applied it to this case. When we do the computation here, notice that in these four different things that can pop up after doing decomposition, none of them involve orbifolds by the subgroup B. They all involve orbifolds by other subgroups. And since the other subgroups, well, if the anomaly lies in here, then the other subgroups are all anomaly free. So indeed, we're seeing that X mod gamma is giving us an anomaly free result. Now that's just a D4 extension. If we pick a different extension, we will get different results. So let's try that. Let's pick a different extension of Z2 cross Z2. So here, let's take, uh, let's take the, the eight element group of unit quaternions. This is again, an extension of Z2 cross Z2 by Z2. Um, the quantum symmetry is determined by the image of on A and B generating the Z2 cross Z2. Um, the quaternions does not admit any discrete torsion. So there's only one column of possible results. Um, the flavor of the results is a little bit different, but we're getting a, a, the same basic result at the end. If there's no, 
quantum symmetry. If the quantum symmetry is um, uh, for the trivial case, for the trivial for the choice of trivial quantum symmetry, so that the image of D two is trivial and no anomaly can be resolved, the anomaly is just copies of G orbifolds, which is not helpful. But since we're not resolving anything, we shouldn't expect to get anything any different. In these three cases, something more interesting happens. In each of these cases, the image of D2 is non-trivial. Now, it differs in these three cases. Before we got the same image for D2 in each case, here we have three different images. Um, so we could use this case to resolve an anomaly in either the A subgroup or AB subgroup. We could use this to resolve an anomaly in either the B subgroup or AB subgroup and so forth. And in each case, we get as a result of decomposition that the theory is an orbifold by a subgroup which is not anomalous. So here, the anomalous subgroups were A and AB. Here, it's the other subgroup, B, that appears. Here, the anomalous subgroups we could resolve are B and AB. Here, it's the other one, A, that appears. Here, it's A and B that could be holding an anomaly. Here, it's AB that appears. So another example. Um, uh, so let's consider an extension of Z2 cross Z2 by Z2 cross Z4. So another example with a trivially acting Z2 subgroup where the Z2 now lies inside that Z4. Um, the details of the pattern differ, but the basic upshot that the wang wenten procedure works is in evidence. If there's no quantum symmetry, no anomaly is resolved, and we just get copies of G orbifolds, not surprising. In the other cases, an anomaly is resolved. The pattern of which anomaly is resolved depends upon all well, the extension and the choice of quantum symmetry. And in each case, the orbifolds we get as a result of decomposition have the property that they are orbifolds by subgroups that are different from subgroups that might be hiding in an anomaly. So here, for example, we could be hiding an anomaly in the AB subgroup, but AB does not appear in either of those factors. And similarly for the others. Now, in these examples, I have chosen a sort of minimal resolution. I don't have to choose a minimal resolution. I could pick a much larger resolution. Um, um, right. So if I pick a much larger resolution, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to get copies of the same results as before. So for example, uh, here I picked an extension given by Z2 cross the eight Long group of unit quaternions. It's just twice as big as what I needed. Um, when I look at the results, they follow the same pattern, except on this side, I just get two copies of everything I had before. So it's still anomaly free. I just get copies of stuff rather than um, a minimal choice. But you know, the anomaly is still resolved. So that all works. All right. Uh, future directions. I am right at my time limit. But maybe if I take just another one or two minutes, I can quickly flip through some future directions here. Um, sure. Uh, boundaries. So boundaries and orbifolds with quantum symmetries. So I mentioned earlier that in orbifolds with a trivially acting subgroup, the boundaries are naturally associated to the universes of decomposition. Um, the boundary carries a possibly projective action of gamma, so just restrict to the subgroup K. The action of gamma descends to some possibly projective representation of K, which basically tells us which universe the boundary is associated to. Now that works fine in cases in which that orbifold has just discrete torsion. But what about quantum symmetries? Turns out something more interesting happens there and we're still trying to figure out, we're still trying to understand it properly. So in this case, the associativity of the gamma action is slightly broken. The gamma action is only homotopy associative. Um, and I'm currently working with Tony Pantab to try to understand that properly and um, uh, give a proper name to that particular pain. Um, another direction, we could work in two plus one dimensions and apply the same procedure. Um, there won't be a decomposition in two plus one dimensions. I only expect a decomposition in a uh, D plus one dimensional theory with a D form symmetry. In a, two in a two plus one dimensions, I would get a one form symmetry with these methods, but that wouldn't give a decomposition, but you could still ask what happens? Why is the anomaly resolved? What's going on? And we are currently, I'm currently looking at that now with Daniel Robbins and Thomas van der Gulen. One can apply the same wang witten procedure, extend the anomalous orbifold group to a larger subgroup, pick some phases, which now live in a different group cohomology group, um, but which have the property that there is a differential that sends this group to the group containing the anomalies. Um, 
and that implies the pullback of the anomaly is trivial. Again, we don't expect a decomposition in this case, but it's still kind of fun to wade through the details and um, understand why the physics is being resolved in this case. All right, uh, so to summary, to summarize, um, I spent a lot of time telling you to, talking today about decomposition in which one quantum field theory is secretly several. If you forget everything else I've said today, if nothing else makes sense, then let me ask that you take this, uh, this one uh, claim away from the talk, that decomposition is a statement that one quantum field theory might secretly break apart into several field theories. Um, the symmetry reason for this is that decomposition appears in n plus one dimensional theories with n form symmetries. I focus today on examples in one plus one dimensions because that's directly relevant to anomaly resolution, but examples of decomposition in other dimensions also exist. We can apply this to understand that anomaly resolution procedure. Again, the idea is we replace an anomalous G orbifold with a non-anomalous gamma orbifold with some phases where gamma is some extension of G and these Bs correspond to certain phases we have to turn on. But then decomposition implies that that larger orbifold with the phases is just copies of a quantum field theory of an orbifold by a non-anomalous subgroup. So on this side of the equation, the fact, the lack of an anomaly is completely explicit. This, this relation makes the fact that the wang wetten procedure works completely clear because we, you take the, the orbifold that wang wen wetten start with or that their procedure produces. And now we can see that it is just literally copies of, copies of explicitly non-anomalous orbifolds. So to my mind, this gives a very um, uh, simple and clean way to understand the physics of, um, of what's going on there. And I'm now a few minutes over and I know you have another talk coming up. So let me thank you for your time and stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Question from the audience, please feel free. Uh, can I ask a question? Please go for it. Yeah, so uh, we know that uh, in, two, uh, in two dimension, uh, TQFT corresponds to color BL categories. Does this decomposition co uh, corresponds to semi-orthogonal decomposition of the corresponding category? For, for, a, for a unitary topological field theory, uh, yes, yes, it does. And, and the reason is exactly what you just described. Um, you know, going back to the old literature, when I say old, I, I'm thinking, for example, of a paper from 93, but it might have even been known before then. Um, Two-dimensional unitary topological field theories indeed have the property that their Frobenius algebras are semi-simple, which means there exists a complete set of projectors. All the local operators are linear combinations of projectors. And that's exactly what's uh, that's exactly how I think about decomposition in the case of topological field theories. And dijkraff witten theory is, for example, a special case of all the remarks I've made about orbifold. So yes, indeed. Um, in the case of unitary topological field theories, decomposition is immediately a consequence of semi-simplicity of the Frobenius algebras. Um, in a non-unitary topological field theory, uh, we'd have to have a longer discussion. So for example, I could talk about the A or B models on some target space. So those also define topological field theories, but they're not unitary. And there, I don't expect the decomposition story to work in precisely the same fashion, or rather I only expect a decomposition um, in the case of the A or B models, if the corresponding untwisted physical sigma model decomposes. There may be some decomposition you could do formally at the level of uh, the Frobenius algebra for the A or B model, but the way I think about the A and B models is that they are small subsectors of a larger quantum field theory. And there might be some sense in which you can get those subsectors to decompose, but if the entire quantum field theory isn't decomposing, then it's not a very satisfying statement. Um, by contrast, in the unitary topological field theories, so uh, dijkgraf witten BF, um, well, the zero area limit of pure Yang-Mills or pure Yang-Mills itself, if you're willing to expand your notion of topological field theory slightly, um, uh, and other examples I'm certain I'm forgetting, um, because of those unitary, because those examples are unitary and because the algebras are semi-simple, you get a complete set of projectors. So not only do those theories decompose, but they decompose all the way down to invertible um, field theories, all the way down to completely trivial field theories. And the symmetry reason underlying that is the existence of a 
uh, typically non-invertible one form symmetry defined by the algebra, basically defined by the algebra of those local operators. Um, yeah, I, I, think that, I think that addresses your question, but I, I, uh, let me know if I've missed the mark. Yeah, so yeah, th th thank you for, yeah, thank you for answer answering my question. So I just wonder, uh, as you mentioned before, the SIGA model in uh, X, div, uh, X over G, is this, uh, so th th is this a uh, unitary quantum field theory? Yeah, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, this yes. no, no, it's, okay. it's all good. What I'm, what I'm, so in this talk, I was mostly, the, indeed, in this talk, I was mostly talking about um, these orbifolds. And uh, for me, these orbifolds are always going to be unitary quantum field theories. So um, all the theories I was talking about today are assumed to be unitary. In a non-unitary theory, um, uh, in a non-unitary theory, you know, in principle, bad things could happen. I don't want to think about non-unitary theories. But every everything I talked about today was uh, by assumption a unitary field theory, not necessarily unitary topological field theory, but at least a unitary quantum field theory. Uh huh. I, I see. Uh, so uh, for these theories, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, there are this decomposition. But for example, if we consider the B model into that X over G, that is, we consider the uh, derived category of coherent shifts on these things, right. uh, we do not expect uh, decomposition. So, um, um, well, actually, well, uh, uh, let, me, let me be careful about that. If you have, um, uh, so, uh, if we have if we have a jerk okay so some things can be said about the a and b models I, I i i've hesitated to go there because of for fear of confusing matters but um if the original if the physical theory decomposes then the a and b twists will in a useful way as well by which i mean not just that topological subsector but the whole uh twisted theory so for example if i take uh one of these yeah. gamma orbifolds with a trivially acting subgroup um, I can indeed be yeah. twist, and then indeed the derived category is also going to decompose. That's just the a holomorphic analog of the decomposition of K theory I mentioned earlier. So in that case, the the B model will decompose. But I, yeah. I think about that as basically following from the fact that the physical untwisted theory decomposes, and then when I topologically twist, you know, the, the topological twist goes along for the ride. Um, but I I just wanted to distinguish that from you know, general statements about semi-simple Frobenius algebras and two-dimensional topological field theories. I, I'm only expecting a decomposition. If I start with the topological field theory, I only expect a decomposition if I know it's a unitary theory. But if I start with the physical theory and the physical theory decomposes, and, I, and then I topological, topologically twist, sure. The topologically twist, the, bleh, I can't speak English today. The topological twist is then also going to decompose as well, following the same pattern as the physical theory. Uh -huh, I, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. If you have other questions, feel free to email me later. We're, I know there's another talk at four o'clock and it looks like we're beginning to run up against that time. But if you have other thoughts, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to chat about this to great length. So thank you very okay, much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Eric Sharp for the wonderful seminar. So. We'll You're very welcome. For one more seminar. So, so let me uh, start the live stream and thanks again. All right.